In this video, I'm going to start discussing pilot wave theory, or oftentimes called Bohmian mechanics, and that's because it was discovered, or at least rediscovered, by this guy here, David Bohm. And so in 1952, he released a couple papers where he proposed this theory, although it had actually been briefly proposed by Louis de Broglie, de Broglie, de Broglie. I never know how to pronounce his name. And so these two people, so it's oftentimes called Bohmian de Broglie theory or just Bohmian mechanics. So there are multiple names for essentially the same thing. So like I said, it was first proposed and then dropped in the 1920s by Louis de Broglie when it did not go over very well, except with Einstein, who seemed to like the idea, but everybody else didn't seem to like it back in the 1920s, and so he dropped it. But it was rediscovered and championed by David Bohm since 1952 when he released two papers where he talked about this idea. And so, like I said, it's sometimes known as Bohmian mechanics. So John Stuart Bell, who I've talked about quite a bit in these videos, was a proponent of pilot wave theory. And so Bell said this about Bohmian mechanics. But in 1952, I saw the impossible done. It was in papers by David Bohm. Bohm showed explicitly how parameters could indeed be introduced into non-relativistic wave mechanics with the help of which the indeterministic description could be transformed into a deterministic one. More importantly, in my opinion, the subjectivity of the orthodox version, the necessary reference to the observer, could be eliminated. But why then had Born not told me of this pilot wave? So he's talking about something he read about Born. So a book of Born's that he read where Born was sort of expounding on the fact that, you know, there could not be any hidden variable theories. And so Bell is saying, but why then did Born not tell me of this pilot wave, if only to point out what was wrong with it? Why did von Neumann not consider it? More extraordinarily, why did people go on producing impossibility proofs after 1952 and as recently as 1978, why is the pilot wave picture ignored in textbooks? Should it not be taught not only, not as the only way, but as an antidote to the prevailing complacency to show us that vagueness, subjectivity, and indeterminism are not forced on us by experimental facts, but by deliberate theoretical choice? And so he's railing here against the quantum orthodoxy, which is kind of the Copenhagen interpretation and in saying that all these people are always talking about how it's impossible to have hidden variable theories of quantum mechanics. But he's saying that even if we say that pilot wave theory is not actually the right way to think about quantum mechanics, it is at least a viable hidden variables theory. So in the previous video, I talked about the koken specker theorem, which showed that you have to have contextuality in your hidden variables theory and Bell himself showed that you also have to have non-locality and what we'll see in the coming videos here about the pilot wave interpretation of quantum mechanics is that it both is contextual and non-local while also being a hidden variables theory and so it sort of satisfies all of those constraints put on a hidden variables theory and so Bell is saying, why aren't people bringing this up as at least a way that you could think of a hidden variables theory, even if this one isn't the one that actually ends up being the case. But anyway, Bohmian mechanics has essentially two postulates for it, whereas, you know, the orthodox quantum theory has multiple postulates, including the collapse postulate. And so one of the things that's good about the Bohmian mechanics about the pilot wave theory is that its postulates are not sort of ad hoc the way that something like the collapse postulate is. And so I'm going to go into those two postulates, which are essentially the wave equation and then the movement of the particle. And so the pilot wave theory of quantum mechanics seeks to make quantum mechanics complete by adding something new, namely by giving us a particle and its associated wave. So Bell summarized the standard view, so the orthodox view of quantum mechanics is saying that it's a particle or wave, where the pilot wave theory essentially changes it to particle and wave. So what pilot wave theory says 
is that a particle has a definite position, but that it moves according to a wave following the Schrodinger equation. Thus, the particle is always coupled to an associated wave. And so, in a sense, it has both. And so, this is kind of a, a, a GIF illustration here of how, like, the double slit experiment could be explained by this, where we have this particle here in the center of this wave. So, it's following this wave. And so, the wave itself can go through both slits here, but the particle only goes through one. Yet the particle's movement is dictated by the wave, and so that's how you can get that diffraction pattern in the double slit experiment. And so we have the wave that obeys the time dependent Schrodinger equation, which is what we have here in boxed in purple. And so that one is already kind of given to us just, you know, by Schrodinger. So that's sort of the first postulate here of of the pilot wave interpretation of quantum mechanics, that we have this wave and that the wave obeys the Schrodinger equation. And so the thing we have to then account for is the dynamics of the particle. So how is it that the wave is actually dictating where the particle moves? And so that's what sort of the remainder of this video is kind of going to be about. So for the dynamics of the particle, uh, we can look at the de Broglie uh, formula here. So we have the momentum P is equal to the Planck constant over the wavelength. And so we can then put that in terms of the reduced Planck constant and the wave number here. So this is the de Broglie formula relating the momentum to the wavelength and wave number or wave number here. And so if the wave function is a plane wave, of this form, and so we're using this symbol because this is uh, not normalized here, but we're saying that the plane wave has this form here with a definite k, and so that means it has a definite momentum, and the particle has a velocity given by this. So we have the h bar k over m right here. But in the general case, where it's not necessarily a well-defined state here, so not necessarily a well-defined momentum, then we change to the polar form of the wave function that looks like this. So we have our psi here that's a function of position and time. And it's equal to this r here that's a function of position and time times e to the i uh, to the power of i times this right here, which is the phase of our particle. So r here is the radius. So the length of the vector in complex phase space, and S is the phase or angle of the wave function in complex wave space. And so that's what we're showing over here, where R here is the length of this red line. Then the S is telling us the angle of this red line to the real number line right here. So then we get that the velocity is this, so it's dependent on this phase right here, which for the plane wave solution, we had that this is just equal to kx here. So we would just put kx right here. k is our our constant, so we could just take that out. So it's just the change in x with the change in x, so that's 1. And so we ended up with h bar k over m when we were looking at just a plane wave. But this differential equation here, so we'd be solving for the phase here, will work in general. But the question then is, where in space should we evaluate this function in order to obtain the velocity of the particle? And the answer is that we evaluate at the exact location of the particle at time t. And we'll call that uh, x here, that's a function of time. That's giving us the instantaneous velocity here. And so in the simple case, so we're going to evaluate here at the position of the particle at time t. So we have this as our differential equation here, uh, which then can be written in terms of the wave function itself. So this is our wave function. Remember from above, it's this uh, r here times e to the power of i s. And so we are going to write this in terms of the wave function here, which then looks like this. So we do the natural log of everything to get this out of the exponent right here. And we assume that the r here is going to be equal to 1. So this right here, this the magnitude of this vector here is just going to be 
equal to 1. And so the natural log of that is going to be equal to 0. And so then if we divide each side by i, we get this. So this is what our function for the phase here is going to be. We then take the derivative with respect to x on both sides. What we end up with is this, or the derivative of our wave function here, the derivative of the natural log of it anyway. And this gives us the instantaneous velocity in terms of the wave function. So this, so right here on the left side is our instantaneous velocity, and so that equals this, where this i m is just telling us that this is imaginary right here. That's because we have this i term right there. But we see that the velocity of the particle at a well-defined point x at a given time is based on the change in the wave function, so that's this term right here, and inversely proportional to the wave function, so that's this right here. Then how do the probabilities in the theory arise? So let us say we have a single particle in one dimension, so that's this, and then it's complex conjugate here, so multiplying the first by this and the second by, uh, so the first by the complex conjugate of the wave function, the second by the wave function, we get this, and then we're going to subtract the second, so we're going to subtract this one from this one, and there is a bunch of math that goes on here. You can look through this on your own if you want to, but I'm not going to talk our way through it. But what we end up with is this. So we have the change in the square of our wave function with respect to time is equal to this, uh, which is a derivative with respect to space here, so our spatial dimension x. And this has the form of the continuity equation from electrodynamics, which is this, which we can do then in three dimensions like that. And so what the continuity equation is telling us is that if we have some charge in a given area here, and the charge in this given area, so in this box right here, changes from having one of these charges move out, then we have this change, we have this current here, so the J is the current. It's telling us that there is a current of charge moving out of this area. So this is the continuity of charge, density, and the current. So where rho is the charge density and J is the current. So, you know, a current just like the, an electric current, moving charge. Uh, so it's essentially saying that any increase or decrease in charge density and a given region must be accompanied by that same amount of charge coming in or going out of the region in the form of a current. So if we have charge moving out or moving in, then we have this current here. Uh, but if the charge density is not changing, then the current is equal to zero. But for quantum mechanics, instead of charge, what we have is probability. And so this is uh, the conservation of probability, since this uh, the square of our wave function here is the probability. So the change in that probability uh, in time, which means that our current is this, uh, or we can put that in 3D here. And so this is the probability current. So the flow in or out of a region, in other words, the rate at which the probability in a region is increasing or decreasing. So we can think of our wave as changing in time. So the crests and troughs sort of moving in a, in a particular spot in space is changing in time. And so we can think of that as a probability current where in a given region of space, if the probability is increasing then that must be coming from somewhere uh, adjacent to that space. And so we have that the probability current has to be moving in or out of that space if our probability density is going to be changing there. And so that's sort of the, the continuity here, which tells us that we aren't just sort of discontinuously changing the probability in a given region. So in electrodynamics, we also have that the current is equal to the velocity times the charge density here, where again, the V is the velocity of the particle, and that gives us this right here, 
where the velocity is equal to the current divided by the charge density. In quantum mechanics, we have that the probability density, which is our rho here, is equal to the product of the wave function in its complex conjugate, and the probability current is j. And so this is an important result here, because the velocity v depends on the probability density rho, means that the velocity is dependent on the instantaneous position of probability of all other particles, which means that Bohmian mechanics is fundamentally non-local. So we have this probability density here, and the velocity of a given particle is dependent on the total probability density of other particles, so essentially entangled particles. And so we're saying that the velocity of this particle is dependent on the instantaneous probability density of other entangled particles. And therefore, you know, even if, if this other particle is, you know, a million miles away, then its velocity is dependent on the probability density of that particle a million miles away. And thus, Bohmian mechanics is fundamentally non-local. And so as I said, there will be more on this in future videos, but I just wanted to make sure to point out that this is an important result for Bohmian mechanics, for the pilot wave theory here. All right, so in orthodox quantum mechanics, there are no literal particles, only wave functions. So uh, the psi is the only thing that we uh, are discussing in orthodox quantum mechanics. But in pilot wave theory, there is a literal particle which will have a velocity of this, uh, which is what we got from above. So we have up here, this is from the continuity equation in the numerator up here. Then this down here is our rho, that is our probability density. And since we have this here being equal to this, which is what we obtained above, we get this right here. So we have this, which we got from above up here, but that's equal to this, which is exactly what we had in the green rectangle above. So it's exactly what we had right here. And so that is the uh, velocity of our particle. And we can see, again, that that is dependent on the wave function. So what this shows, as I said, is how the velocity, so the movement of the particle, is related to the wave function. You'll often see this, which is called the guiding equation, frequently put in generic coordinates for n particles. So if we have a multi-particle system, you'll see it put like this. And we can see uh, that there is kind of another problem here that I will discuss more in future videos, is that if we put this into generic coordinates here, which we have to do for n particles, this is now in a high dimensional phase space. And so trying to relate that to what's going on in three dimensional real space can be kind of a complication here. But like I said, we'll get to that in future videos. And so for the nth particle of this n particle system, so of spinless non-relativistic particles, and I will, I will discuss uh, how Bohmian mechanics handles spin in a later video as well. So we have this uh, right here, where our j here is our probability current, and this rho is our probability density. So what it comes down to is this. Pilot wave theory says there are two equations governing the motion of the particle, and those are the Schrodinger equation which tells us how the, the wave function, the actual wave part of our wave particle system is going to evolve, then the guiding equation, which tells us how the particle will move in response to the wave. And so we can uh, think about it like this. Uh, we can see the guiding equation depends on the Schrodinger equation. In other words, it depends on the wave function. We can interpret this as saying that the velocity, which is the speed and direction of the particle at a particular position, uh, is determined by the value of the wave function at that position uh, at a given time. We can see how if the magnitude of our wave function is large, then this term right here, uh, remember that's this term right here in our velocity, in the guiding equation is small. So the particle is moving slower 
and therefore will spend more time there. Thus, it will be more likely to be found there. So we see that when the magnitude of this is large, which, you know, if we think about it in terms of the probability, if the probability is large, then there is a higher chance of finding a particle there. And that makes sense in terms of this velocity as well, because that means because of this right here, it will be moving slower and will therefore be more likely to be found there. Uh, but if we have that this is small, then this becomes large. And so if the particle is in that part of the wave, it will move fast and therefore spend less time there, thus have a lower probability of being found there. Uh, there is more complicated math that I'm not going to go into for when we have psi equal to zero, such as at a node. So we can think of it like this. So we have this part here, which uh, is in the positive and this part in the negative. But if we take the square of it, it will become all positive. And so this part here where it's large, there's going to be a higher percent chance of finding it there. And that's because we have this term here in our our guiding equation. And so the velocity is much slower where the probability is larger. And so that's why there is a greater chance of finding the particle there. Uh, we can see we do have nodes here. And so even if we squared this, this would still be zero. And so there would be, we'd have to look at something a bit more complicated to think about uh, what the sort of speed of the particle is right there. Uh, but, you know, just intuitively, it makes sense that if the particle has a higher percent chance of being found somewhere, then it's going to be moving slower there if we are saying that the particle has a definite position at all times. All right, and then so just to sum up here, so I'm going to give a few quotes here. So uh, Travis Norson, whose book I'm following for this, uh, he said in a paper in 2013, so this is not from the book, but from a paper which is going to be linked to in the, in the lecture notes, which are uh, linked to in the description down below. So he says, critics of the pilot wave theory often argue that the addition of these definite particle positions is pointless or metaphysical because at the end of the day, the theory's empirical predictions match those of ordinary quantum mechanics, which latter predictions are, of course, made using the wave function alone. And so what he means by metaphysical is, you know, it's sort of postulating this thing, this, this particle, that you know you don't really need a, to explain the results of quantum mechanics. It's kind of like saying gravity is based on the curvature of space-time, but also magical elves. So you don't need the magical elves as part of your explanation because the curvature of space-time is sufficient. And so he's saying that people call the the particle in this uh, pilot wave interpretation metaphysical because it's not a necessary to uh, to sort of think about quantum mechanics. The wave function alone is sufficient. And so he says, what the critics fail to appreciate, however, is that adding the particle positions allows something to be subtracted elsewhere in the system. In particular, the dynamical laws sketched above, namely the Schrodinger equation and guiding equation, constitute the entirety of the dynamical postulates of the pilot wave theory. No additional axioms or special exceptions to the usual rules, such as the collapse postulate of ordinary quantum mechanics, need to be introduced in order to understand measurement or, more generally, the emergence of the familiar everyday classical world. And so he's saying that, you know, by postulating this particle that actually has a definite position is not... It's, it might be metaphysical in, in that way, in that maybe, you know, it doesn't give us any more information than what quantum mechanics does, but it does allow us to take away this collapse postulate, which is kind of one of the big problems of orthodox quantum mechanics, because it's 
saying essentially that you know everything evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, but then this sort of magical thing happens when you do something we call a measurement, and then a the particle sort of pops into existence. And so if we just say that the particle always has a definite position, then we don't need this collapse postulate. And so we might be having a, you know, sort of pay a little bit of a price by saying that the particle does have a definite position at all times. But what we're gaining back from paying this price is something much better, which is having getting to do away with things like the collapse postulate and the measurement problem and things like that. All right, so then the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy Entry on Bohmian Mechanics says this. So Bohmian Mechanics inherits and makes explicit the non-locality implicit in the notion common to just about all formulations and interpretations of quantum theory of a wave function on the configuration space of a many particle system. It accounts for all of the phenomena governed by non-relativistic quantum mechanics from spectral lines and scattering theory to superconductivity, the quantum Hall effect and quantum computing. In particular, the usual measurement postulates of quantum theory, including collapse of the wave function and probabilities given by the absolute square of probability amplitudes emerge from an analysis of the two equations of motion, Schrodinger's equation and the guiding equation. No invocation of a special and somewhat obscure status for observation is required. And so again, this is expounding on the merits of our Bohmian mechanics, of our pilot wave theory, by saying that we can do away with these issues that come up with the collapse postulate and the measurement problem and things like that. And also saying that it can account for everything else that is uh, in the orthodox quantum theory, which is when when you're trying to come up with an interpretation or a theory sort of uh, or foundational theory of quantum mechanics, those are definitely the things that you need to do, because orthodox quantum mechanics, which essentially amounts to the shut up and calculate version of quantum mechanics, is extremely successful. It makes very good predictions, and so you can't come up with an interpretation of quantum mechanics that cannot account for the great success of orthodox quantum mechanics. You're the, I mean, the base level of any interpretation of quantum mechanics is that it must at least explain all of the things that orthodox quantum mechanics can do. And if it can have, you know, merits beyond that, then that's even better. But at the bare minimum, at least has to be able to account for all the phenomena that you can predict and observe in orthodox quantum mechanics. And so this is saying that the pilot wave theory does actually, is actually able to account for that. And in later videos in the, in this series uh, of talking about the pilot wave interpretation, I'll actually go into a little bit more detail about how the pilot wave theory can account for things like like spin and uh, scattering and things like that. All right, so this last quote here, this is still from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. For an n-particle system, these two equations, so the Schrodinger equation and the guiding equation, uh, completely define Bohmian mechanics. So again, saying that we don't need to bring in those, you know, silly postulates like the collapse postulate. This deterministic theory of particles in motion accounts for all the phenomena of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, from interference effects to spectral lines, and it does so in an entirely ordinary manner. Uh, so that line, I think, is maybe overstating it, because like I said, we do have non-locality in Bohmian mechanics, which I will get into again more in future videos, but uh, it is still at least a bit more intuitive than the orthodox quantum mechanics. And like I said, it doesn't have to bring in the collapse postulate, which is, you know, one of those things that is is something that has haunted the the orthodox quantum mechanics uh, since its inception. Uh, but anyway, in this video, the main takeaway is essentially that 
we have these two equations here. So the Schrodinger equation, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, and the guiding equation. And these are sort of the things that can explain all of quantum mechanics according to the pilot wave interpretation of quantum mechanics. And like I said, I will get into more detail about how it can explain certain phenomena in future videos. Uh, but anyway, I hope you found this video interesting, uh, and I will see you in the next one.